<laughs> We're going to turn the floor over to Yanison. Um, a few people are joined us. We know that people will continue to join us, but Yanison told me that he's going to speak for about an hour and there may be questions and I may have to get to my activity or not. So we are going to let Yonason speak. I'm going to ask everyone to mute. We are going to record this. Please stop. Um, and we are going to start with that. So everybody could please okay. mute your mic. Mute yourselves, except for Yonason who's talking. Yeah, um... And I am going to turn the floor over to him. He has a very interesting topic to discuss, oh, and we're going to... And very creative. Oh, that as is usual. that is an understatement. <laughs> I either this is going to be really useful and people are going to like it, or it's just going to be me saying weird stuff. I mean, I'm going to be upfront about that. There really, there really is no two ways about this one. So, uh, you know, with that said, I'll even get a little weirder. Recording in progress. Yeah, you know, with with that said, I'll, I'll even get a little weirder. You know, as an introduction or maybe as a warning to the talk today, I'm going to give is a quote from the famous 16th century German alchemist, Benedictus Figullus. Quote, My son, understand here, the luna metaphorica, not the literal. So we are, we are diving deep into metaphor, the metaphor of moon symbolism for Rosh Hashanah. So today's talk will be esoteric. Like I said, you know, it'll probably even be annoying at times. But I'm doing it anyway, and I hope it turns out well. So, so here's the deal. Today I'm going to be struggling to define what it means that Rosh Hashanah is Yom HaKesa, the hidden day, as it's referred to in Tehillim and Mishlei. I'll be taking a rather unique approach, drawing from Jungian psychoanalysis, specifically Jung's work in alchemy. The meaning of this symbolism is one that's been bothering me for some time. So, some background on the Gemara. You know, first off, the term Yom HaKesa is explained in Gemara Rosh Hashanah twice and once in Gemara Sanhedrin. In Gemara Rosh Hashanah, Daf Ches Amad Aleph, the Gemara is struggling there to figure out. And the very, from the very beginning of the Gemara, it's kind of fascinating. The Gemara seems to not really know when's Rosh Hashanah. You know, it's struggling to figure out how we know the Day of Judgments on Tishrei. So, you know, one of many of the resolutions that are thrown out in that Gemara comes from a, a remark in Tehillim, Pe Aleph, uh, Pasuk Dalit, that states below in the blow in the month a shofar in the hiddenness, which is the day of our celebration, which holidays hidden. The assumptions made that this hiddenness must refer to the moon. The allusion to the shofar automatically is assumed to be rooted in a judgment motif. So locking in those two facts together, a holiday that occurs at the new moon, plus the reference to shofar, plus there's a subsequent pasuk stating. For this is the, the statute of Israel, a judgment of the God of Yaakov. This has us identify Rosh Hashanah as beginning in Tishrei. A similar explanation is given uh, later on Daf Lamed Dalet, Amad Aleph. Now, now the logic here in both Gemaras is fuzzy. You know, technically speaking, this doesn't prove Rosh Hashanah is in Tishrei. Uh, to, make, to, to, to make sense of this, we have to throw in a major caveat. You know, quite often, the Gemara is not attempting to prove something from scratch. The starting position often is that we're taking on the Oral Torah as fact, but we're attempting to see if our living practice can be justified from the text itself. So this explains the many assumptions that are not questioned. You know, we know there's a Rosh Hashanah. We know we blow shofar on that day. We've been doing it since the, you know, since time immemorial. You know, the new moon on Tishrei, we've been doing that the entire time. Where is this alluded to? Hey, we got to Hillel. So, so we're constructing a DNA of Rosh Hashanah from the text, but, but these are things we've already assumed. The hidden day, the shofar, judgment as we see the, you know, we see the same DNA strand in the text. That's what we got. Uh, Gemara Sanhedrin, Daf Tzadi Vav on his base, further locks in uh, these three aspects of Rosh Hashanah's DNA, together illustrating that these aspects make, make, make such intuitive sense that the, e the evil Nebuchadnezzar gets how these three pieces must go together. There's an intuitiveness, apparently, in the symbolism, this DNA fitting together. Uh, so the first time I learned Gemara Rosh Hashanah, you know, going back more than 10 years ago, you know, I, I, I've, been sat, I've been sitting with this question for a long time. You know, exactly, you know, 
how is this symbolism first, how is it interconnected? You know, why are these three pieces of Rosh Hashanah's DNA self-evident, even to the evil Nebuchadnezzar? What's the meaning, the necessity for the Day of Judgment to be on a day which is hidden? You know, there's little discussion on this in classic sources. What little there is written on this topic only raises more questions. The al a student of the Ramchal, writes on that Tehillim, and I quoted, that the, the, the sense of victory within judgment is a process that begins on Rosh Hashanah but ends at the full moon of Sukkot, with our lulav in hand. So how does Sukkot get schlepped into this symbolic mess? Who invited it to the party? It would be easier to gloss over Yom Akesa, let it remain hidden, and just go with it. That's a Rosh Hashanah thing. But it seems to me something so fundamental that it needs to be understood, because after all, this is the name of Rosh Hashanah itself. And what's in a name other than a, a concept's fundamental nature? Without knowing what this term means, we don't understand Rosh Hashanah. Without it, we don't fully understand the process of judgment and repentance that we definitely need to get during these three holidays of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, to Sukkot. So today I'll, I'll be making an attempt at what the symbolism of Rosh Hashanah as Yom Kisei is, and how that symbolism fits into the other symbols of the day, judgment of the king, hope for victory in the divine court, the call to repentance, where Sukkot comes into this, and why the call from the shofar to confess and repent gets expressed by our ancient sources as the shofar literally crying to us. And I understand my own crying with personal confession, but such a, such a confession is, extr is strictly forbidden on Rosh Hashanah. You can't cry during that day. As any good drill sergeant worth his salt would say, no crying, soldier. Indeed, as one interpretation in Gemara Rosh Hashanah expresses it, we pass before the king not as the lambs we hear about so frequently in these sorts of talks, but as hardened soldiers of war in King David's army. The call of repentance is given to us in tears by the shofar, but we ourselves are obligated to keep a stiff upper lip. So the angle I'm taking in arriving at some understanding to these symbols is relevant to our work as therapists. And I'm going to be drawing from a uniquely psychological approach to symbolism, specifically Carl Jung's development of alchemy as a map to psychology. Or better put, by James Hillman, Jung's own heir apprentice at the Zurich School after Jung's passing, alchemist therapy is the science of soul making. So if you dislike the religious conclusions I draw here, that's fine. There's great utility in understanding how the Jungians and the archetypal psychologists use alchemy as a roadmap to therapy, to soul making. Uh, you know, indeed, Jung, Jungian analysis is the rich mother soil that recent and much less complicated approaches like internal family systems and other parts work systems have sprung forth from. And a fair word of warning, the psychological alchemy is not the entirety of Jung's theory or even the body of it. It, it would be fair to say how, it, it's more like the ligaments and tendons that hold together the frame of a skeleton. And without them, not even the muscles can hold the entire body together. So to, to say that the importance of understanding alchemy in our work it's not obvious. I mean, that's an understatement to say it's not obvious. First of all, why need alchemy? Listen, it's not scientifically real. I mean, it's, this is, it's pre-chemistry to the extreme, you know? This, this stuff is just not real. Second, the paradigm it has and, and the way its ideas are expressed, they're erratic, they're confusing, and even intentionally coded by the authors. You know, third, it deals in, in primal images, primal experiences. And fourth, its obsession with balanced relationship between complex materials, between metals. I mean, that's just, that's striking. I mean, that's just, that's what it's about. Yet, it's because of these four reasons, I think, that the psychotherapist ought to familiarize himself with alchemy, as it describes the nature of our work so accurately. To reformulate the list here, you know, first, no one enters our office for a lesson in objective reality. No one's searching for an equation. They're, they're searching to escape the, confuse, the confusing mess that their experience and their, and their, their life is filled with. And, and it requires a burning away of a great many beliefs that are not useful to them. Second, you know, we must know to navigate 
the erratic, confusing, and intentionally coded world of the psyche. The study of alchemy and psychology certainly is a fertile training ground for that sort of work. Third, the psychic life. While it uses linear thinking, it's not rooted in it. You know, our mind is fundamentally organized around associative thinking. I images bound together by messy emotion. Now, now, logic, more often than not, is a tool we un unknowingly misuse for that purpose. But the fundamentally, our thinking is associative. And lastly, you know, every problem any client has is fundamentally a problem in the chemistry of their relationships. How are they intertwined and changed by the relationships with themselves, others, and the ideals they so, they so often self-flagellate with? While true, the stated goal of alchemy was the creation of gold out of base metals, this too is a metaphor, as they saw no difference in the material, the material world vis-a-vis -vis the psychological world. The alchemists were the first psychotherapists. Their honed research over thousands of years across the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Asia, it demands our attention. So Jungian psychology, and certainly it's, it's, it's alchemical component for sure, you know, it, it is not extensively talked about in your standard university education. And before diving into today's topic, a significant primer is definitely in order. Jung in general is little more than a side note, or at best a paragraph in our psychological textbooks in university. And they're always slipped into the five chapters covering Freud. And I think it's an irony that modern psychologists ignore Freud, who named Jung his own heir apparent, yet have followed old Freud in casting Jung out of the camp. Jung's crime, he fundamentally disagreed with Freud's psychological religion of sex, objecting that his lack of complexity and fear of addressing survive, uh, survival, the human spirit, creativity, and our deep cultural bonds across time and space made it a mere ideology, not a robust psychology. As the field developed and the dogma of tabula rasa and postmodernism became ingrained in academia, Jung had no place in the humanities. Today still, Jung has no place <laughs> in those departments, but as Jung poignantly observed, one can never truly cast out the shadow. His work is alive and well in the biology, genetics, cognitive science, and sleep departments of the hard sciences, which firmly reject simplistic tabula rasa philosophy in, in the human, that are held up in the humanities. You know, it's astounding how Jung's work predicts the fundamental findings in these areas, and an irony that a man who is so often mislabeled as a mystic has his spirit firmly ingrained in nourishing the hard sciences. Simply put, from Jung's perspective, man is more complex and infinitely deeper than the descendants of Freud or Rousseau are comfortable admitting. So with that, on to Jungian alchemy. The simple definition of alchemy is what makes it so complex. Its simplicity is deceptive. The goal of alchemists was to, was to produce what was called the lapis philosophorum, the philosopher's stone. Now this stone, you know, in quotations here, in theory, had the ability to turn base metals into gold. What's almost never talked about, almost as if hidden, like the moon of Rosh Hashanah, is that in this process of, of, of arriving at, silver, at gold, you have to go first through silver. That's, that creation of silver is an essential precondition to gold making. Silver, being the metal of the moon, a point I'll, I'm going to swing back to as, as, as this really is the linchpin of my understanding of Rosh Hashanah's symbolism as a, as a moon as a moon inspired holiday. So okay, fine, great, a never ending source of money. All right, not so fast here. Here's where alchemy ceases being understandable to the modern mind of materialistic science. Now, while modern science focuses on the world of information and data, a world of things, alchemy focused on the world of meaning. Gold, for the alchemist, was not a valuable metal per se, nor were they interested in becoming Mr. Moneybags here. You know, rather, what made gold or any material valuable in the eyes of, of, a, of an alchemist wasn't its physical material nature at all. Its physical nature was looked at as a manifestation of the object's soul. Gold's soul, it was thought, was a mortal life, spiritual peace, and health. It was shining, illuminating truth with a capital T. So, so alchemy was an outgrowth of astrology 
and the ancient idea that the planets imbued meaning into our world. You know, the seven planets, seven spiritual forces, enriched life and the potential for soulness through the metals they gave off. You know, these celestial metals were, you can kind of think of them as like con congealed, condensed gases, and they were transmitted via the moon. Through, through the metal, the moon itself exuded silver. While the moon col uh, collectively imbued the world with these other six metals, the, the sun imbued the earth with gold. Jung, quoting the alchemist Michael Mayer, outlines the basic principle of alchemy. The sun, by its many millions of revolutions, spins the gold into the earth. Little by little, the sun has imprinted its image on the earth. And the image is the gold. The sun is the image of God. The heart is the sun's image in man, just as gold is the sun's image in the earth. And God is known in the gold. Put another way, by the Zohar, through the gaze of the sun and its power, dust evolves and grows gold. What's made of dust of the earth? Man himself. So summing up the two d d direct sources of metallic energy, the, another Kabbalistic work, the, the Kesem Paz, clarifies that gold is of the sun and silver is of the moon. The earth, which is a, is a manifest of, sil of sulfur, you can kind of think of this as, a, as the animalistic urge, the primal need, the, the consuming passion. It receives all these forces from all of these, all of these metals. These combined metals that are manifest on Earth, it was thought, could be transformed through a purification process of intense but precise exposure to fire. Through the hand of the alchemist, the different substances are cooked, being broken down, combined, and transformed. Not as material objects, but as containers of meaning, whose meaning is manifest in physical characteristics. But, uh, put another way, quoting Jordan Peterson, alchemical matter was the stuff of which experience was made, and more, the stuff of which the experiencing creature was made. Again, the, the ultimate goal was the creation of gold, but this stage could only be reached through the refinement of silver. As the Zohar states, when silver reaches its fulfillment, it becomes gold. We find then, as silver transforms itself into gold, and when this happens, it attains the stage of perfection. The, e, the Ish Matzeref, another Kabbalistic work, describes this process of silver making as taking four months or longer to achieve. So, so the, 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 the primal elements of the world are in fact implicit and hidden in the world. At any moment they could manifest themselves from the world in which they, they reside, that they're embedded in, transcending that material world. It's not difficult to see the psychological idea of different parts in this way of thinking. The alchemist was someone who could, via curiosity, exploration, and the hero's spirit, bring forth this transcendence in his work and give it harmony amongst all its parts in the final product of gold. Signing Peterson again, the pre-experimental mind of the alchemist, pondering the nature of the prima materia, the fundamental constituent element of experience, easily becomes possessed by intimations of the infinite possibility of matter of the boundless significance of the finite object, of the endless utility of the object, and its inexhaustible capacity to reveal and to become the unknown. The alchemist used his craft to transform the wish for self-betterment from base earthly corruption and suffering into transcendent reality. Again, the first therapist. Yeah, but before diving into the ABCs of alchemy, I, I do have to pause here on, on where it fits into Judaism. You know, especially seeing as I'm, I'm de here I'm, I'm decoding, this is, a, this is a Rosh Hashanah shir. You know, I'm decoding the symbolism of Rosh Hashanah, and, and the DNA of alchemy is certainly found within Jewish thought, as I've already been citing the Zohar. In fact, many alchemists believe that it was impossible to understand alchemy without deep knowledge of Kabbalah itself. This went for Jews and non-Jews alike. In fact, the Philosopher's Stone concept itself was identified as the Megane David, the circle background behind the star itself representing the Ein Sof, infinity, the upper triangle symbolizing fire and the downward triangle water, the basic building blocks of the universe, Shemayim, Aish and Mayim. Clearly the fundamentals of our belief is predicated on the assumption of the transcendent nature of the physical world.
from dust to gold. The sister concept of astrology, so necessary in alchemical thought, the planet's metallic seed becomes embedded. It impregnates itself into our reality. And the moon is the conductor of these forces that combines them in its white light and plants these forces in the material world is so rich in our tradition that to cover it here would be a lecture in itself. The Zohar and other Kabbalistic works not only outline each planet's corresponding seven essential metals, but also mirrors the symbolic nature of each within the system of the spheros. So divine meaning as above, so it is below. It's noteworthy that uh, Rav Moshe de Leon, the premier source and commentator of the Zohar himself, was an alchemist, of which his work we have access today, the Shekel Kodesh. Rav Chaim Vital, he studied alchemy for many years, quoting from his work, Shivchei Rebbe Chaim Vital, uh, Rav Vital writes that he, quoting the, uh, you know, referencing the Arizal, also told me that he saw inscribed on my forehead the verse from Shmos, and to devise skillful works, and to work in gold and in silver and in brass, an allusion to the two and a half years during which I gave up the study of Torah and pursued alchemy. So alchemy doesn't just exist as an important aspect in Kabbalistic thought, but is also reflected within the rationalist Rishonim as well. We see in Chavos of Vavos references and descriptions of it. In Ibn Ezra's commentary on the Chumash, a great example is his, in Shmos, his description of the golden calf and the, the burning down of the golden calf as being an alchemical process. Uh, and the Rambam in his Igeris Asodos, where he explains to his student Yosef Ibn Aknin the secrets of alchemy in uh, Shar Hashemayim in that work. So definitely has, has, a, has a central place in Jewish thought. Diving into the paradigm of alchemy as a map of psychology, it's relevant to note that just as in normal psychological development, there are natural processes in the birth of gold. Left long enough, base metals do develop into gold according to this paradigm. Most people do live their lives, growing and becoming more than the sum of their parts. Despite being a neglected field in favor of abnormal psychology, there's such a thing as normal psychology. And uh, for those of you who are subscribed to, to the journal Abnormal Psychology, they're even they're chucking its name. It's no longer going to be called abnormal psychology to, to, to try and accentuate more how important this idea of normal psychology is as an untouched part of our, part of our field. So base metals do have a will to mate with other substances and do become gold on their own. Left to our own devices, we do become more enlightened. As the mythologist Eliade states, if nothing impedes the process of gestation, all metals will in time become gold. If there were no exterior obstacles to the execution of her designs, nature would always complete what she wished to produce. Yet these processes are unguided and left to chance left to fate. Some people during some time in their life do fall apart. Their baser elements, not cooking to completion, are stalled in their transformation towards gold. This is where the therapist, the alchemist, steps in as a midwife to nature, enabling their clients to become their ideal. And it should be obvious by now that within Jungian psychology, you know, with, with the, the strong emphasis on, on ethical moral, virtuous, the virtuous language in, in the way he looks at alchemy. So Jung saw the act of therapy as an ethical one, centering around the most fundamental ethical and moral question of all, how do I live my life best? Jung's ethical substructure, the, the clear result of alchemy at four stages. First, confession, where the client shares his story, experiences, and problems. Second, elucidation, where the transference relationship is worked through via interpretation, heavily focusing on dreams and images. Third, education, which expands all of the insights from the transference work and applies them into the social, behavioral, and on the archetypal level in a, in a person's real life, day-to-day, day-to-day world. And finally, transformation, where the therapist helps the client proceed into the stage of what Jung called individuation. So he, he, now here's where a brief description of the alchemical process is in order. What I'm going to do here is we'll review the symbolism of silver, gold, and the actual alchemical process of you know, cooking silver into gold. 
After this, we'll revisit the symbolism of Rosh Hashanah in light of the al alchemical paradigm. And as you'll see, the symbolic imagery from alchemy to Rosh Hashanah lines up beautifully and is so intuitive. I, I think even Nebuchadnezzar could get the point. So the symbolism of silver. Silver is the essence of the moon. It's shining white. Unique amongst all metals, its, its nature enables it to hold the different paradoxical souls of all the other metals. Just like man, contained within silver, there are many parts. The more unrefined the silver, the more those parts are in conflict. And what makes silver unique amongst all other metals is that it does have the ability to hold the contradictory nature of all the other metals so that it doesn't suffer from their shadow aspects. Now, silver, in a sense, is the only metal that has integrated its shadow, the goal of Jungian psychology. It's conductive, like copper, but it doesn't passionately burn or ignite. It's noble and beautiful like gold, but harder and less malleable. It can be made useful like tin and lead, but has luster. It reflects. It's free-flowing like mercury, but also hard. It's adaptable yet flexible. Thus, its virtue is as a cool and calm conductor with ennobling stiffness, which is reflective, flowing, but adaptive and consistent. This is the soul of the moon. This is the moon's inspiration to us on Rosh Hashanah. Silver is not only reflective and discriminating, traits of wisdom, but also has an inherent aesthetic value in of itself. The mixture makes it unmoved by passion, its receptive focus and, appreci and, and its appreciativeness uh, can also cast light on ideological superficiality. Thus, it's fundamentally the precondition for shining gold, truth, because it's able to reflect upon things as they truly are. Its spoken truth is subtle. Unlike the undeniable shine of the sun, the moon's silver is quiet and humble. But when struck, Unlike all other metals, when you hit it, it rings. Silver sings. When confronted, it stands its ground with beautiful clarity. This stable, reflective wisdom, the key traits of the psychotherapist, is found in the world through suffering and destruction. Alchemists disagree over where silver can be mined, but the common thread in all of their reports is it's mined from tragedy. One report has it emerge after the deadly destruction of a forest fire, the catastrophic loss of life and beauty. In psychological terms, it's the wisdom of post-traumatic growth. Another report links it as emerging through lead, the metal of Saturn. This link brings to mind the connection between the Jewish people and Shabbos. The Jewish people are symbolically represented as the moon itself, and Saturn is the planet that reigns during Shabbos. So, so the old saying that it's not the Jews that keep Shabbos, but that Shabbos keeps the Jews does not go far enough in the eyes of alchemy. The Jews are created out of Shabbos. Different Midrashic views report Saturn as, as feared by the non-Jewish non world. Lead, its metal, was seen as a debased and almost fallen type of silver, lonely without the Jewish people, symbolically viewed as a deeply depressed state until God assures one day it will have its mate. So there's a deep sad and, and loving longly, lo loving, loving longingness associated with silver. Both lead and silver were not in common day use before Roman times. Uh, both are very difficult metals to work with practically. And so, you know, given this, they both were, were always associated with the, me the, the mystical and the spiritual as opposed to the easily worked metals of Mars's iron, Venus's copper, and Jupiter's tin. The mystical nature of silver is further evidenced by how easily it tarnishes in air. It's not for this world, and its sanctity ought to be protected. It needs to be hidden away. A further allusion to the special nature of Rosh Hashanah, the hidden day. So su summing up these symbols, there's a, there's a quiet, tragic nature to silver depression, facing destruction, loss, loneliness, with a cool, resolute mind. There are qualities necessary uh, found in silver 
in the firming up of the mind to give a strong backing to the mirror, its reflective nature, this mirror effect of silver, and the absorption of all other planetary forces to serve as, as categorical constructs in understanding the living world, its wisdom, beauty, and sadness. This is the story of the Jewish people. So what's the alchemical process itself? How do you do the cooking? The process is known as the opus contra naturum, work against nature, roughly translated. It's a, it's a transcendence. This is real psychological cha a change in a three-stage process, which is, which, is, which is held up foundationally by fire, this secret and sacred principle in its work. You can think of that as motivation. Then air, the, the nourisher. This is the idea of possibility psychologically, and then earth, the smotherer, which it limits and fixes and stops. And that's the therapist, the one who's running the process, guiding the client on this, on, this, on this transformation. So the three stages of alchemy, the first is called the nigredo, the blackening and burning. As the alchemist Philalethes explains, your substance will never be white if it has not first been black. It's by means of putrefaction and decay that it attains the glorified body of its resurrection. It's the breaking down of parts. One can think of this stage as the assessment phase, uh, diagnosis, the, this initial intake work. For Jung, this is the confession phase of therapy, which can be a long, arduous process truly tearing apart the psychological defenses of the client, its black decomposition, the burning away of the dead wood. The second stage is called the albedo, the whitening. This is the emergence of silver. This stage is the, the cleansing, the shining, purifying aspects of the work. It's the beginning of consciousness. While the negretto is past-oriented, you know, unearthing the history and the past traumas, this stage is rooted in the present moment. If the negretto is the burning away, the albedo is the continued fermentation and direct challenging of a much stronger and wiser and stable, more stable client. The final stage is the rubedo, the emergence of gold from silver, the reddening, you know, a, a, a certain passion. The, the, the two, silver and, and the, the nature of gold, they're, they're becoming alloyed. Silver is transcendent spiritual state of awareness, it's mystical light, this, this, this revealing and humble truth becomes combined with gold's blinding power, its obvious truth, and moral righteousness. Silver without gold is subtle. It's a whisper of one can barely hear at times. Gold without silver is superficial ideology. Together, it's the sun's truth emerging from the moon's, from the, from the moon's beauty. Now, here I'm going to begin outlining the symbolism of Rosh Hashanah, you know, the, the point of, of today's talk. As the festival inspired by the moon, as Yom HaKesa, the hidden day, while simultaneously outlining where the alchemical process and the psycho psychotherapeutic process can go terribly wrong. Just as the alchemical process of, of purification and perfection of tshuva the process of the Yom and Narayim have three stages. We're going to see that symbolism as well here. So Rosh Hashanah is the negretto. The moon's black. Now, just like in the, the chaotic burning of the negretto, the temple service is also in a state of chaos. Where are the witnesses of the new moon? When can the proper sacrifices be given? Is it Chol or is it Kodesh? Is it a normal day or is it Rosh Hashanah? Is it even the holiday to begin with? Just like the beginning of the therapeutic process, it's often not obvious that change for the better has even begun. An added motif of chaos here is the attempt to confuse the Satan we have during the Rosh Hashanah services, you know, the random shofar blowing that we do throughout, throughout, the, 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 throughout, throughout Shachris, throughout the morning services. The Satan, the accuser, you can kind of think of him, he has the DSM in hand. He's ready to diagnose. He's ready to spell out the problem without any real solutions. The sign of a novice therapist. Everyone has a diagnosable problem somewhere, and I'm ready to find it. Never mind the DSM commission itself and its famous white papers to the DSM-5. It to a complete failure of their research mission in outlying mental illness and 
a breakdown in grasping anything real in their diagnostic criteria. They published the book anyway. A, a modern version of alchemy, perhaps, in terms of its connection to real-life assessment. But the darkened moon holds the soul of silver, but it's been blackened. In our year, we've exposed the silver we created in the previous year as Russia shut a process to the contaminating air of our mistakes. Our silver has blackened in its deconsecration. In many ways, our soul has become hidden through the effects of Tuma. The shofar expresses the depressed and melancholic nature of silver, the sad longing for us to be its partner, just as Shabbos did as it waited for the creation of the Jewish people. The shofar, too, is where silver can be mined. It represents the raging fire of the Torah that begins to cook in this first stage of alchemical transformation. So why not do tshuva on this day? Why is, it, why is that not the point? Why, why, why is crying forbidden? Here it's appropriate to list the several dangers in the opus contra naturum in the alchemical three-stage process. The first is transition as sudden transformation. We've all had the client who rushes into our office proclaiming psychological sin after sin. After the long and detailed account of the problem, we, we may even mistakenly believe it's time to start cooking. Nah, I'm fine. Overreacting. I don't really have a drinking problem. I'm happy with how my relationship is. This is fool's silver, the claim of innocence. Again, quoting Hillman, it's the Mr. Clean, the aspirin consciousness, the smiling girl in the white cowboy boots, the toothpaste smile, the wasp saying, how about a game of tennis? Just fine, just fine. Two variations of sudden transformation are, are one, uh, take special note here. The sudden claim that the therapy has worked. Problems are whitewashed instead of cleansed. The second's much darker. As, as a person begins to burn their impurities, the vitality and energy of life springs forth just enough to trigger nihilistic hopelessness. Such clients regain just enough energy of life to attempt suicide at this stage. True silver is a recovery of innocence. It's achieved through a hardened wisdom. In short, it's not something anyone is able to rush into. To do otherwise only triggers well-practiced defense mechanisms. Nothing was ever wrong to begin with. I have been cured in sudden suicide. We do not attempt shuv on Rosh Hashanah because if we did, it would fail under the weight of our psychological defenses. At most, it's only safe to listen to the call of the shofar, tapping into the seriousness and wise sadness of true silver. The second phase of the process, the albedo, begins on Rosh Hashanah. Here on, on, on Yom Kippur, we begin to truly confront our impurities and silver is able to emerge. This is why we wear white on Yom Kippur. This is the day silver begins to emerge out of the black. Long drawn out and detailed confessions were now strong enough to be confronted. The humility and divinity of silver brings our head down in vidui, in confession, as we beat our sulfur impassioned heart. Just like silver, we're strong enough to take a bit of a beating. The danger at this point in the, in the alchemical process is premature heating. Too much heat leads to burnout. Here's where we find ourselves as therapists fighting with our clients. A, a second danger here is vitrification. Instead of silver emerging, the entire pot turns to glass. All change is frozen and impossible. Here there are only simple solutions simple explanations and wise sounding mottos, but no tension, no dialectic, no wisdom. The entire substance is transparent without body. So I'll just stop being insecure. Well, I'll, just I'll just express my feelings as they are. That's healthy. Anger is okay. Well, I can just ignore the anxiety. Yeah, it's everyone else who really sets me off. Uh, if, only they w if only they just wouldn't do that. If only they would hear me. Here's where true insight breaks down into a transparent, superficial truth. 
all can see through, except the client himself. This is why each vidui is spread out over the entire day in small spurts. We need time to process. The pot needs to breathe. The tension needs to be held. The third phase, the rebeto, is the emergence of gold from silver, sukkis. With the transformation complete, there is light, energy, celebration, and gratitude. We go out into our sukkas to embrace the sun's light. We hold the arba meaning, holding in harmony all the different parts of us and using those parts to worship God. Now the process of transformation could not be finished on Yom Kippur due to the final danger in the alchemical process, premature cooling, coming off the high of Yom Kippur to normalcy. This is the premature conclusion of therapy. Instead, after Yom Kippur, the fermentation process has to be maintained to fully bring out the light and luster of gold. So, so before finishing this talk here, you know, there, there's one last aspect of the chuva process worth mentioning, and that's the water libation of sukkahs. You know, each morning during sukkahs, the sacrifice would be offered, accompanied by silver and gold trumpets. The Kohanim descended from the woman's court to the eastern gate. There, the feminine quality of the moon and the, and the eastern sun. There they turn west towards the temple with their back facing the sun, declaring, Our fathers who were in this place stood with their backs to the temple and their faces eastward and worshipped the sun, but our eyes are to Hashem. Taking into account everything I've covered today, this esoteric reference to the sun worship becomes abundantly clear. Even after undergoing this transcendent and transformative experience, even after beauty and truth, wisdom and righteous conviction have been bound together into a mature psychological state, we admit our growth has one limit. While we're obligated to emulate God, halacha bedrachav, we must attempt to transform ourselves into his image. It's only ever a facsimile. We can never actually become the sun. We must never deify our transcendence. We will never be God, only his loyal servants. I, I hope this wasn't too esoteric, but um, I just wanted to give everyone a bracha here that they should cook well during their Yom and Narayim.